Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Um, I, I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, we have a baptism at 10 o'clock, so that's what's in the bulletin, but obviously we're not doing it here, so after uh, the sermon, we'll continue on as we normally do with the greeting that's the prayer of the people. So, uh, I have a friend who is a longtime parishioner at a local church. Uh, she's in her mid-70s, and a while ago, uh, two of her grown children or her families were visiting her, they don't live around here, uh, for the weekend. And on Sunday morning, as she was getting ready to go to church uh, by herself, the others were not in that habit, uh, one of her kids said, Mom, why do you go to church? Why do you go to church? And it's a question that caught her a little by surprise. Uh, she was one of those people, there, we have them here, who you, that might, you might as well have asked them, why do you eat? Why do you breathe? <laughs> but for most of us, it's a question we should remember to ask ourselves regularly. What are we doing here? Why are we here? Because life is always new. And the reasons why we walk in those doors on Sunday morning are always evolving. Why do I come to church? Of course, there are many ways to answer that question. For me, one of them would be that we come to church on a regular basis because we want to live truthful, honest lives in a world that is noisy and confusing and in which we are pulled powerfully from the outside in many directions. And here, we say we're not going to allow ourselves to be pulled. If we have anything to say about it, there's one God, one source of truth which we strive to recognize, and we're going to be intentional about that. We want to see, speak, and do the truth. And we come here to learn about that because we feel that the truth is here. In this Christian story that we explore together, that we puzzle over together, that we, we soak ourselves in, week in and week out. That's why we come to church. For me today. It's particularly appropriate that we're, we ask ourselves uh, this on a day when we're going to have a baptism, when we as a community welcome a new fellow traveler on this way that we try to follow. A big part of the rite of baptism is, is practice in the Episcopal Church is reminding ourselves of what we do here. We repeat our baptismal vows. We go over the basics. By the grace of God, the lectionary readings that we just heard today, the sixth Sunday in Epiphany, I'll pick one out of a hat, uh, together point to an answer to this question. Why do we come to church? On first hearing, those three readings don't seem to have anything in common other than the fact this is what struck me at first, that all three of the people who were speaking, Moses, Paul, and Jesus, seemed to have gotten up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. They just a little cramped. Because each in his own way, they're all responding to the same truth about humanity, about us, all of us together, and about each of us individually. Which is this, how easy it is for us to go wrong. And at the same time, how simple it is to go right. And you notice how easy and simple are not the same thing. Something even simple would be very difficult to do. The sayings of Jesus in the Gospel passage sound like it's long. It's a grab bag of judgments on various points of the law, which seem unrelated, except to say, seemingly, that we're not nearly as hard on ourselves as we should be. But if you look at them a little more closely, there's a common theme that emerges. Jesus mentions a bunch of things in the, that the law prohibits. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not swear falsely, you shall divorce only in the proper manner as prescribed by law. But Jesus says, it's not just murder, forget that. If you're angry with someone, if you call someone a fool, you're just as liable to judgment. Forget adultery. If you look at someone with lust in your heart, you're just as liable to judgment. Forget swearing falsely. If you swear at all, if you use an oath, even with good intentions. You're just as liable to judgment. In each of these comparisons, as different as they appear to be, murder and casual insult, the act of adultery and a lustful glance, swearing falsely and swearing by anything at all, what we're actually doing in both of those cases, the big one and the little one Jesus sees, what we're doing is putting ourselves in place of God. We're shoving God out of the way. 
removing God from our lives in the present. The degree of the offense may be different. But we shouldn't kid ourselves about it, Jesus says. The movement of the Spirit is essentially in the same direction. Even when the offense seems small, we're compartmentalizing God. And when we do that, we cut ourselves off from God, from the true source of love and peace and joy and truth. That's why Jesus cares about this. It's not about making sure the guilty get their just desserts. It's about staying awake to the life of God that is around us all the time. Right there waiting for us. How easy it is to pretend that God's not there. How easy it is to go wrong. And how simple it is to turn away, to turn back and go right. In the passage from 1 Corinthians that we heard today, Paul points us towards how simple it is to go right. Uh, as in most of his letters, Paul is writing back to a church that he has founded uh, and has moved on from, but, but with whom he stays in touch, makes sure things are heading in the right direction. And the message has gotten to Paul from that church that there's a problem, that the church of Corinth has split into rival factions. One of the leaders there is a man named Apollos, probably the guy Paul left in charge, and some church members there have been saying, we need to follow what this guy is teaching, and others are saying, no, 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 Paul's the man, Paul is the one that we need to hold up. That's what they're squabbling about. And Paul writes nothing here about the substance of what Apollos might be saying. We don't hear anything about that, whether they're justified at all. In fact, he actually endorses Apollos, puts himself, puts Apollos on a level with himself. Paul writes, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And this is not an idea of Paul. It's not a theory that he's trying to sell to people. It's a description of reality, the way things actually work in life for him. That's what we need to focus on. The way to go right is simple. Turn to God. Only God gives the growth. Only God gives the the growth. That truth, that same truth, is expressed beautifully and powerfully in some of the words of Moses that we heard in the first lesson today. That lesson is from near the end of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, very near the end of the long, long story of Moses. He dies four chapters later. Uh, he has led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt over many miles and many years and four whole books of the Bible, 147 chapters. It's a long story. And now, finally, they're at the very edge of the promise line. The bank of the river Jordan. He has also led them through the wilderness of the Spirit. Into a relationship with God. And now he gives them the law. That's the book of Deuteronomy. He gives them the law to guide them forward. Because he's going to die. He's not going to be there with them. And at the very end, it's what we heard today. After the law, it is a valedictory. A summing up, Moses says... See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. In the law, things to do and things to avoid. And having put those two before his people, his final word is this. Choose life. Loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you. Choose life. It's no different for us. I think that's a pretty good capsule description of what we're doing. We come here to choose life. However imperfectly, however messily, we do it. We choose to open our eyes to God's new creation that is going on around us all the time. Young children and the parents of young children see this as clearly as anyone. We choose continually. We choose to turn in that direction, to join in that work. We plant, we water, knowing that God will give growth. So we give thanks to God. We give thanks for this life that we have together and for the new life that is forever springing up around us. Amen.